All right, good morning, Church on Main. Welcome. I told the uh, early service that uh, everybody that came got a gold medal for coming this morning. All right, all right. Uh, but thank you for being here. We also want to welcome any guests that we may have this morning. If this is your first time to visit or first time in a long time, hope that you'll go to the Welcome Center uh, and fill out a Connect card and uh, you have a gift for you as well. But we're glad that you're here. If you're watching online, uh, there's information there on your screen about how you can get in contact with us. We'd love to... to uh, hear from you and uh, to, to meet you. If we can do anything for you, let us let us know. Just a couple of announcements. Uh, Tommy and Susan are away uh, in Europe for their 45th wedding anniversary. They should be somewhere on the Rhine River, but we expect them back uh, next next Sunday. Uh, also, I uh, want to remind uh, parents our grandparents, uh, that tomorrow begins our mega sports camp. It's being held out at Price's Fork. Uh, if uh, your child or grandchild wants to go, if you know have a neighbor kid that you think might want to go, they can go online, go on our church website, and you can register for that, or you can register out there at the, at the site uh, tomorrow. Let's pray together. Father God, we are so grateful that we can come to you today. And no matter what's in our heart, Lord, we just turn it all over to you. And you carry us and you heal us and you take us in to the life that you need us to live so that we can serve you and show others your light. And so right now, I ask that you just calm our hearts and calm our minds and, and let us see you and let us hear you. Take the stresses of the week and wash them away, Lord, that we can just focus on you. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> just a couple of other announcements uh, before I read our scripture lesson for today. Uh, we just had a mission team that came back from the Dominican Republic. They've been there all this past uh, week ministering to... Uh, uh, the folks there. Uh, we also have an opportunity uh, if you want to adopt a Haitian uh, child. Uh, it's called Project Esperanzo. There's a table over here. Reed, you'll be over here at the end of the service. If you'd like to do that, it would give you more information about how uh, you can do that. Also, we have up here, the GAs are collecting change uh, to, uh, to buy a bed for Sleep in Heavenly Peace, which uh, provides beds to uh, children without them. So if you have some extra change before you leave, if you want to uh, help them with that, that it's right here at the, at the front. Well, our scripture lesson is from Genesis chapter 1, uh, beginning with verse 26. If you hear with me the words of the Lord. And then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And then God said, Behold, I've given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth, and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be food for you. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the sky, and to everything that moves on the earth which has life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw that all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You know, one of the lesser known stories of that great theologian, Dr. Seuss, is called The Lorax. It was published in 1971 
It was quite controversial at the time and was in fact banned from some libraries and some schools because it warned against unbridled consumerism and the exploitation of the natural world. Now, if you haven't read the book or you haven't seen the movie, we have a picture of a Lorax. That's a Lorax, okay? And Dr. Seuss describes the Lorax as shortish, oldish, brownish, and mossy, and speaks with a voice that is sharpish and bossy. Well, the Lorax voice is this way because it's his job, it's his vocation to speak for the trees, specifically the truffula trees. Now, I think we got a picture of a truffula tree right here. You see, truffula trees, according to Dr. Seuss, they have no tongues. And the Lorax gives voice to their concerns. But unfortunately, the Lorax's voice is no match for what is called biggering, that turns truffula seeds into thneeds. So let me explain. Biggering is wanting a bigger chair, a bigger desk, a bigger office, a bigger house, a bigger car, a bigger anything. So embiggering just triggers more biggering and wanting more and more thneeds. And th thneeds are not things we need, they are things that we are made to think that we need. So when the ax fell on the very last truffula tree, the Lorax took leave of that place through a hole in the smog without leaving a trace but the Lorax did in fact leave something behind. He left a small pile of rocks with the word unless, unless. And here we discover the meaning of the Lorax's message. Now that you are here, the world of the Lorax seems perfectly clear. Unless someone like you cares an awful lot Nothing is going to get better. It's just not. And with that insight, the reader is entrusted with the last remaining truffle seed. And in hopeful concluding words, the, the narrator of the story declares, if we plant a new truffle and treat it with care, give it clean water and feed it fresh air, grow a forest and protect it from axes that hack, then the Lorax and all of his friends, they may come back. You know, I think it's safe to say that evidence is growing every single day that the general ecological state of our planet is not good and it's getting worse. The earth is aching, the earth is groaning, it's been damaged and, and much of the responsibility can be attributed to past and present human behavior. For example, water purity is a troublesome problem. We may think otherwise when we turn on the tap and outflows an endless supply of water, but water scarcity is perhaps the most unacknowledged ecological problem today. Millions of people in the world do not have access to clean drinking water. It's projected that nearly six billion people will suffer from scarcity of clean water by the year 2050. And this is the result of increasing demand for water, the reduction of water resources, increasing pollution of the water driven by dramatic population and economic growth. Whether intentional or unintentional, we are polluting our streams, rivers, and lakes, as well as the ocean. In fact, just a couple of weeks ago, um, uh, we had a family reunion at Lake Gaston and we got a word that uh, we were to stay out of the water of Lake Gaston because chemicals had been spilled uh, upriver near South Boston. Of course, our family was swimming in the water, but uh, intentionally or unintentionally, we're polluting our streams, rivers, lakes, as well as the oceans. We're destroying our tropical forests at an alarming rate. Only 36% of the tropical rainforests that once covered the Earth's surface still remain intact. Just over a third are completely gone and 30% are in, for, in various forms of degradation. The pace of deforestation is devastating. And that's just the rainforests. 
Loss of topsoil is a major problem. Worldwide erosion rates are 20 to 100 times the uh, natural renewal rate. It takes an average of 500 years for one inch of topsoil to be created. Deserts are growing as the land is degraded. And what about the amount of solid waste that is created? Each year, solid waste from the United States alone would fill a convoy of garbage trucks that would extend around the planet eight times. And what about energy? With only a fraction of the total world's population, the United States uses about a quarter of the available energy. An average U.S. citizen consumes almost double the energy consumed by a typical resident of another industrial country and 20 to 30 times as much energy as the average citizen in a developing country. And do you know how many species of plant or animal life become extinct every year? Three species every day. Every eight hours, another species is gone. 66% of the world's birds are in decline. 11% of all birds threatened with extinction. 11% of all mammals are already endangered. Another 14% vulnerable to extinction. Close to 20% of all reptiles and 25% of all amphibians are currently classified as endangered or vulnerable. And 33% of all species of fish are already threatened with extinction. Now, these statistics may or may not be alarming to us. I mean, it's easy to not care about the purity of water for the rest of the world when our water seems to be perfectly fine. It's easy to not care about the loss of the rainforest since they're not in our own backyard. It's easy to not worry about the loss of vital topsoil when we can just go to the grocery store and we can get what we need. It's easy to not be concerned about where all the garbage and other refuse goes when we can just set it on the curb for someone else to pick up and take it to the landfill. The use of energy may not concern us when we can just go to the local gas station and we can fill up or we can just flip the switch in our homes and it, we take it for granted that there's electricity. The loss of biodiversity of wildlife, flora and fauna doesn't seem to personally touch our lives. And so we maybe just don't give a whole lot of thought to it. Now, we may or may not think about these things, but these issues touch on a vital biblical teaching regarding our stewardship and the care of God's good earth. Why should we care for God's creation? I mean, didn't God give us dominion over his creation? Doesn't that mean we can do to the earth and its natural resources what we want? Is it not ours to use or ours to abuse? Can we not exploit it for our own use? If you look at the larger biblical perspective, the exercise of dominion is a far cry from domination. You know, the ideal king is one who rules and exercises dominion properly. Such a ruler executes justice for all. He helps the needy and the poor, embodies righteousness in all that he does. The ideal king uses his authority to serve, not to dominate, not to exploit, not to abuse. And the same is true when it comes to the stewardship of God's good earth. You know, humans are called and they're given responsibility to rule the earth, just as I just read from the book of Genesis. But only if ruling is understood rightly, which is a call to serve, we are to serve and we are to protect the garden that is God's creation. You know, one of my favorite authors, authors is Kentucky farmer and poet Wendell Berry. And he states that ecolog the ecological teaching of the Bible is simply inescapable he says, God made the world because he wanted it made. He thinks the world is good and he loves it. It is his world. He's never relinquished title to it. He has never revoked the conditions bearing on his gifts to us of the use of it that oblige us to take excellent care of it. And if God loves the world, then how might any person of faith be excused for not loving it or justified in destroying it? So folks, if there's, you know, if there's anyone who should take leadership 
in the care and the stewardship of the earth. It should be people of faith. You know, the very first verse of the Bible says, we all know it, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The story of our origins tells us that God is the creator of all things. The heavens and the earth and everything in between comes as a result of God's creative word and his energizing spirit. The universe is a place of order and structure. It is purposefully and lovingly designed by God. Creation is good, very good, the scripture says, a judgment that reflects peace and beauty. The earth is home for all earthly creatures. It's a habitat not only for humans, but for all living beings. Humans are not the only creatures blessed by God. The birds and the fish are blessed as well. We share our home with other creatures. And so what does this say about the care of God's creation? It says that every animal and plant that populates the earth is created by God and therefore is valuable irrespective of their usefulness to us. And such value implies that we must not needlessly harm those species under our care. We must preserve and protect our non-human neighbors. It says that we must learn to live within our means, conserving and preserving our resources by exercising self-restraint and, and living frugally. It says we must be cautious and act with humility and honesty when making decisions about the future, uh, providing for the future generations. We must resist the drive to exploit the earth. The earth is not ours. We're not the owners. We are the earth keepers called to serve and to protect the earth, to preserve the earth's fruitfulness. And so we must be willing to promote the well-being of all those who live in the garden we must also hear the cries of injustice, not only in regards to human, but also with respect to an aching earth and all of its other creatures. So why should we care for the earth? Well, let me give you some reasons. We should care for the earth, first of all, because it's in our own self-interest. It's in our own self-interest. It's in our interest as individuals and as a country and ultimately as a species to take better care of the earth. For example, it's in our self-interest as humans to protect our rainforest since the, the very air that we breathe, more exactly the oxygen we need to survive comes from, among other things, the trees of the earth. It's in our self-interest to preserve and to protect the quality of our drinking water and other threatened resources necessary for human existence. We should care for the earth because if we destroy it or if we diminish it, we imperil our own existence. We should care for the earth because it's in our self-interest. And secondly, we should care for our earth because we have an obligation to future generations. We have to consider the impact that our present decisions and actions regarding the environment will have on our children. So I said, we don't own the earth. We are to use its resources, but properly understood, the earth and its inhabitants are entrusted to us to use in such a way that our descendants will also be enabled to flourish. They're also entitled to a habitable earth. And this claim or right entails that we have certain obligations and certain duties. In short, we should care for the earth because we owe it to our children. We have an obligation to future generations. And then also we should care for the earth because it liberates us from the notion that well-being is something more than being well off. More is not necessarily better for us or for the earth. Our consumer culture of getting and overspending all too often masks an inner spiritual emptiness. As long as we persist in defining well-being predominantly in economic terms, we will remain unsatisfied. You know, there's an old shaker hymn that says, "'Tis a gift to be simple, "'tis a gift to be free." A life of simplicity that cares for the earth is one that is able to discern what is truly valuable in life, 
such as respect and humility towards all of God's creation, the use of self-restraint, the practice of frugality, the desire for justice. And we can only truly be free if we are liberated from the belief that our security is based on getting more and more and more. Well, another reason we should care for God's creation is that, hey, we're all in this together. We're all in this together. All of us are bound together in such a way that we are interdependent. John Muir, the, the great naturalist, once said, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. The entire interconnected community that is the earth forms the context for our making decisions and taking actions that benefit the good of the most people and contribute to the care of all of God's creation. All of creation was created for the glory of God. It was designed to sing God's praises. And it's our task and it's our privilege to worship in concert with the maker of heaven and earth and with all the other creatures that inhabit the earth. We're all in this together. And then another reason we should care for creation is that God's concerns are our concerns. Human beings are meant to be God's image bearers. And since being an image bearer, God involves, among other things, caring for the needs of others. Humans are called to show the same kind of care that God exhibits. How does God rule the earth? He rules with care, with compassion, with love. Given that God is concerned for all creatures, the scope of our love must include the non-human as well as the human. We should care for the earth because we are made in the image of God. And since God loves all creatures, we should as well. And then another good reason we should care for the earth, that it is a fitting response of gratitude for all that God has given us. There's a hymn called For the Beauty of the Earth. It's got like, 20 verses, <laughs> but uh, in response to the gifts of earth and sky, hill and vale, tree and flower, sun and moon and stars of light, says, Lord of all to thee we raise, this our hymn of grateful praise. You know, gratitude is the grammar of grace. Gratitude is the grammar of grace. It fosters respectful care for God's creation being thankful is the appropriate and proper response to God's providential care for us. And then finally, we should care for the earth because God said so. God said so. He commanded us to be stewards of creation. Our faith demands that we obey God. And folks, this is not always easy. Often we're puzzled as to what we are to do. We may not think there is anything that we can do. It's easy for us to be overwhelmed by the scope of the problem and to think that our little part will not make much of a difference. Knowing how to apply God's command in particular circumstances in the nitty gritty of life demands a good amount of discernment. It's not always easy to know the will of God. So we pray. We pray for divine guidance. We learn how the world works by being informed by the best science. We read the Bible and see what it says about caring for God's creation. We speak to trusted friends. We do our homework on public policy issues. You know, the real problem most of the time, however, is not knowing what to do, but just doing it, just doing it. The problem lies not in our knowing what we need to do, but in willing what we know that we should do. Well, so there's many reasons to care for the earth because our existence is imperiled. We owe it to our children. A way of life that cares for creation is a more fulfilling way of life. Non-human creatures are entitled to our care. It's in the best interest of the entire world. We're made in God's image and therefore should demonstrate care and compassion and love Grace begets gratitude, and gratitude begets care. And because God said so, 
In some, we should care for God's earth because care for the earth is integral to what it means to be a Christian. It is an important part of our ethic, our spirituality, our way of being a follower of Jesus. You know, almost every morning, Luann and I have a devotional time together. And part of that time, we read a poem by Mary Oliver. Oliver had a very difficult childhood. She had an abusive father, and she spent much of her time as a child outside in nature where she found consolation and strength to endure the difficulties of her life. Mary Oliver's poetry is characterized by wonder and awe and a profound connection with, with the creation. She's taught me a lot about the natural world, but most of all, she's taught me how to pay attention to it more closely and to truly appreciate it, which has also led me to a closer relationship with God, who is the maker of heaven and earth. She says, pay attention. Be astonished. Tell about it. We are soaked in distractions. The world didn't have to be beautiful. We can and should think about that beauty and be grateful for it. Some of you know that I'm from Arkansas. There are beautiful mountains, untouched forests, scenic rivers, rich farmland that gives the state its nickname, the natural state. I lived in southeast Arkansas, a very rural area close to the Louisiana border. It's a paradise for hunter, hunters and fishermen. The county that I lived in was called the land of tall pines and pink tomatoes. Yes, that's right. Pink tomatoes. My first job was picking tomatoes. And then I graduated to the packing sheds. And when I got it old enough to loading trucks full of tomatoes. Every year we had the Pink Tomato Festival, the Pink Tomato Parade, the Pink Tomato Pageant to select Miss Pink Tomato and Little Miss Pink Tomato. My town was a sawmill town. The main industry was logging. The largest employer was a wood products company called Potlatch Corporation. I woke up every morning of my childhood to a mill whistle and the sound of a train a hundred yards away from my house taking wood chips to a paper mill on the Mississippi River. The smell of sawdust was pervasive. Logging trucks were ubiquitous. The school mascot was? The lumberjacks. Give them the ax, jacks, okay? I played in a jazz band called the Jumpin' Jacks. My father was an engineer at Potlatch. My grandfather was a logging foreman. I had an uncle who managed timber. I worked there in the summer times. I grew up and I was taught to have a healthy respect for trees, especially pine trees. They weren't taken for granted. Fortunately, Potlatch was committed to a sustainable timberland management. They didn't strip the land of its trees. They were selective. They were careful to reseed and engage in environmental practices that maintained healthy soil, prevented erosion, protected water quality and aquatic habitats, and promoted biodiversity. Sustainability is possible if we use wisely our resources as I was preparing this message, I thought of uh, this uh, a couple of years ago, a childhood friend of mine, Jill Hurston. She was my next door neighbor from the time I was five years old. Jill and I were inseparable. We did everything together for years until one day I discovered she was a girl. <laughs> anyway, Jill's mother had passed away and I called her to see how she was doing. Well, after talking a while, she, she said, well, she had something she wanted to tell me. And I thought, well, maybe one of our mutual friends had, had passed away. And she hesitated for a moment. And then she said, you know, the people who bought your mother's house cut the pecan tree down. I had this visceral reaction, like someone had just stabbed me in the heart. 
The pecan tree was between our two houses and Jill and I had spent hours and hours and hours climbing and playing in that tree and playing marbles underneath it. Of course, I'd spent many hours picking up pecans that fell from it. My relationship to that tree, I would describe as almost sacred. I had a bond with it and it hurt me to know that it was no longer there. I still ache over it and get emotional about it sometimes. And some of you know exactly what I mean. The psalmist wrote, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Do you know creation is the first Bible? The written word of God didn't come for a long, long time. I truly believe God speaks to us through his created order. God's given it to us to enjoy and to use its resources wisely. We're not to exploit it. We're not to abuse it. I said it once, but it bears repeating. As Christians, we should be the first ones to care for God's creation. Our love and care and compassion for it expresses our desire to be good stewards of the earth he's given us. We should be moved by love and compassion and the hope that lies within us by doing our best to care for God's earth. The truth is it's the only earth we have. And if we do that, maybe, then maybe, the Lorax and all of his friends will come back. And the last truffle seed is still in our hands. Let's pray together. Oh God, we thank you for this universe, for its vastness and its riches, and for all the many forms of life, human and non-human, which are part of it and call it home. We praise you for the blue sky and fluffy clouds and the beautiful constellations. We praise you for the sea and for the streams and the rivers and the lakes, for hills and mountains and trees and flowers and the grass under our feet. We thank you for our senses, which we can see the splendor of your creation, and we can hear its many sounds and smell its breath. Grant us, we pray, a heart wide open to all this joy and all this beauty you've given to us. Give us lives so steeped in care for what you have made that we may not pass one day, one hour, without noticing it and acknowledging the things that you have created and are alive with your glory. It's in the name of Jesus, the firstborn of all creation, we pray. Amen. Creator God, as we prepare to leave this place, may your spirit open our eyes anew to the vastness and the splendor of your beauty that is all around us. May we hear and smell and see and touch your glory that is evident in all of your creation. But above all, let us see your beauty in our brothers and sisters, all of them created in your image, waiting to experience that redemption that comes only through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Oh God, we go now to love and serve you, the maker of heaven and earth and the author of our salvation. Amen. <laughs>